pleasure to welcome you to our church online here at Hamilton Baptist. Good morning and a very warm welcome to you to our online service here at Hamilton Baptist Church. If this is your first time with us this morning, if you've maybe popped online eh, a few times, you are very, very welcome with us this morning. We're delighted that Bill Slack will be opening God's word for us this morning as we consider God is holy, the third part of our latest God is series. I just wanted to open our service this morning with the words of James 4 and verses 7 and 8. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I love those words. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We gather again in this way this morning, friends. As God's people, united in our love for the Lord Jesus, united in our desire to lift his name on high. And for each of us this morning, would we draw that little bit closer to the Lord? Would our lives become a little bit more shaped like the Lord Jesus? Would our lives become that little bit more holy? Because as we draw near to God, he draws near to us. What a glorious promise to open our service with this morning. So before we hand over to our worship team, before Linda Aitken leads our children's talk, eh, and before Bill brings us the word, so we just take a moment and commit our time together to the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that today we are able to come to you as your people, gathered eh, spiritually though not physically just yet. We ask, Lord, that your presence would be in our midst. Through everything that is shared, that is prayed, that is spoken this morning, would you speak to our hearts? Would you, through your spirit, continue your transforming work, through your transforming power in each of our lives? Lord, would you receive our worship, our praise, our adoration this morning? Would you help us to focus? We know how distracting it can be being at home watching screens for church and how difficult that is for us. Lord, would you help us this morning to focus on what you would have to say to us. So Lord, we commit our time into your hands and be with us, we pray. Amen. We'll now hand over to our worship team.
Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be able to speak to you this morning in the sunshine too. Today we're going to have a look at faith and what it means to have faith. We have faith in all sorts of different things. I have faith in my car right now that when I get into my car and I turn on the engine, it'll work and it'll take, be able to take me where I want to go. And that faith that I have in my car comes from driving my car every single day. So what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? How do we get faith? How does our faith get stronger? We're going to have a look at some examples of that this morning. Boys and girls, you can see that this morning I am in Hamilton. I am on the island of Arran, on the Brodick Ferry Terminal. And I am having to have faith that when I drive my car onto this ferry, it's going to take me way across the water back to the mainland of Scotland. Well, it was very windy and very bumpy uh, on our sail back across to the mainland, but my faith in the ferry was justified and we did manage to drive off and are ready to drive home. We can have faith or trust in things. We can have faith or trust in people. But what is faith? Faith is trusting in someone or something Faith in God is believing he can do and he will do all he has promised. A person who has faith in God chooses to love and obey him above all else. Juliana has come along today to help me to show you what it means to have faith or to have trust in people. And we have stuck to the current COVID regulations while we've been filming this. Juliana, do you have faith in me? Do you trust me that I'm going to keep you safe? Yeah. Okay, I'd like you to just follow my instructions. All right, I can see exactly where you are and where you're going. You can't see, but if you do exactly what I'm asking you to do, then you'll be safe. All right, take four steps forward. Take two more steps forward. Turn to your right. Perfect. Okay, now take four more steps forward. Are you trusting me more now yeah. than at the beginning? Yep. Okay, that's good. Right, take another four steps forward. Take one more step forward. Whoops. Take half a step back. Turn right round. All the way round. So that you're facing the opposite direction. Turn round again. Oh, 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 turn back. Stop. Fold your arms. Now, there's a seat behind you. Keep your arms folded and sit down. Go on. Trust me, I'm not going to let you fall over. Sure yeah, just sit on. just sit down as though you're sitting in a chair at school. Okay. Sit down, ready? I Go. Really That's you. Oh, I it. oh, well done. Okay. So you had faith that I was going to keep you safe when you followed my instructions. Thank you. So boys and girls, it's good to have things that we can trust. It's better to have people around us in our lives that we can have faith in and we can trust. But most importantly, is that faith that we can have in God and in the Lord Jesus. Faith that would cause us to say that we're sorry for the things that we do wrong in our lives. Faith that would cause us to say, Lord Jesus, please come into my life and be with me every day. So how does that faith get stronger? 
It gets stronger by just practicing it and trusting God each day. It gets stronger by reading the Bible, reading God's word and getting to know what God is like. It gets stronger by speaking to God often in prayer, not just when we're worried, but when we're really happy and when we're wanting to give him thanks for the things that happen in our lives too. Our faith gets stronger when we see God working in the lives of our friends and our families and in our own lives. Our faith will grow as we just trust him. Your challenge this week, boys and girls, is to read or get somebody to help you to read in Hebrews chapter 13, where you'll read about lots of people in the Bible who had faith. Maybe you could draw a picture and you could send it in of the faith in action in some of our Bible heroes. I hope you have a good week this week and that you are able to put into practice your trust in God. Just a couple of things to run past you this morning to let you know about uh, and then we'll spend some time in prayer before we hand over to Bill. Uh, as I mentioned last week, the first of our prayer meetings uh, live here in the building, uh, physically in the building, uh, is Wednesday the 7th of October. You're more than welcome to join us. Uh, and as we've been doing that message, the beginning opening 10-15 minutes will be streamed from the church so you can watch that on YouTube from the comfort of your own home uh, if you would rather and then we'll cut that just before we come to pray together. I'd encourage you to join us this Wednesday on YouTube. It'll be Bruce Bigger at half past seven who's leading us in our YouTube reflection. I found these really helpful 10-15 minute slots just to ponder and to reflect uh, on a thought from the word during the week and I'd encourage you to do also. Please remember the prayer line that is on your screens. Uh, if you would like somebody to talk to, if you would like somebody to pray with you, please feel free to text that number. It's completely confidential. It's there to be used. There is a great team of people who are willing and waiting and ready to respond to you. So please, if you would like prayer this morning, uh, if you'd like to chat to somebody, please uh, send that number uh, a text. And we're also greatly aware uh, of the new restrictions that have been brought to us, something that maybe feels a bit like a backward step uh, into some form of lockdown, but something that is necessary just now. And we just want to reiterate, if, if you need support during this time, or if you know somebody who does, uh, please get in contact with us, please let us know. It can be hard for us to be able to contact everybody all the time, uh, but please, there's a few options of what you could do if you know somebody or you would like some support or help, whether that's uh, physically, somebody to pray with you, whatever it might be, please get in contact. You could fill in the contact sheet on our website, uh, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Or you could contact Robbie or myself and we'll just put our numbers and email addresses on the screen now if you would like to get in contact with us. We don't want anybody in our fellowship to feel that they are unsupported at this time and we want to do everything that we can to make sure that everybody knows uh, they are valued and in their time of need, we absolutely are here to help and support. So with that in mind, with the restrictions that have come into play this week, eh, at the forefront of our mind, shall we just come, bow our heads and pray? Father, as we reflect on these last five or six months of restrictions, something that we thought would last just a few weeks, Lord, we reflect on some of the things that we miss. We reflect on our ability to gather together, though we're excited that we are able to do so very, very soon. Lord, we lift again our nation before you this morning. 
Lord, we are so troubled as we begin to see the rates of, uh, of those who are dependent upon alcohol, dependent upon drugs, the numbers of domestic violence victims, the numbers of suicides all going up at the minute. But we cannot say we are surprised, Lord. Because as this world becomes bleaker, people's mentality becomes bleaker. Lord, there is such a sense of hopelessness at the minute in our nation. But we know that we trust in the one who brings all hope. Lord, we ask that now more than ever, would you use us as salt and light in our communities? Would you use us as people who radiate the beauty of Christ everywhere that we go? Would we be intentional in the way that we speak? Would we be intentional in letting people know of the trust that we have in the Lord Jesus so that they too may find hope for themselves? We continue to pray for our nation's leader. They have so many big and difficult decisions to make. We ask that uh, your wisdom would fill them, Lord. We ask that your light would shine into each of them, Lord, that there would be a real transformation, a conviction, and a transformation of the hearts of the leadership of our country. And Lord, for the many other nations in this world that are struggling to control this pandemic at this time, we know, Lord, that all of this is in your hands. But we ask, Lord, that you would give wisdom to all those who need it to try and navigate and suppress what we face at the minute. We thank you for the wonders of technology. We thank you for the wonders of advances that means that we are able to do things that a hundred years ago were not possible. But Lord, we ask that you would continue to work out your plans and your purposes at this time. How beautiful it is for us to know that you are sovereign, that you are seated on your throne, that our hope is in nothing less than Jesus Christ. That you have paid the price in full, that we can rest secure, that no matter what restrictions may come our way, the Lord Jesus is present. The Lord Jesus is with us. And by his spirit continues to work day by day in each of us. And Lord, we think of uh, our medical professionals here in the church. Uh, we think of those across our nations, Lord, as they maybe thought they were beginning to get back to some kind of normality and, and, and now as, as hospitals and, and surgeries begin to get busier again, Lord, we just ask uh, for your grace to be upon them. Lord, would you strengthen them? Would you be with them? Uh, would you be everything uh, that they need you to be to get through this, uh, this next season and this pandemic? Lord, there are many things that we can bring before you. There are many people we can lift before you. Those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who are grieving, those who are struggling. And Lord, for all our brothers and sisters who need to know your loving touch this morning, Father, would you please do so? Would you make us aware of your Spirit's presence with us this morning? Would we know your comfort and your love? that we are safe and secure in your hands because you are the almighty God. It is our joy to come before you as your people. And Lord, we commit the rest of our time this morning into your hands and ask now as we open the word that you would speak to each one of us. For Christ's precious and mighty name we pray. Amen. We'll now hand over to Bill. Thank you. Well, it's lovely to be with you uh, this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at God is holy. And so we read from Isaiah chapter 6, reading from the first verse. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. 
Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I'm doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. Before we come to God's word, let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your life-giving word. We thank you you reveal your truth to us through your given word. And we pray that as Isaiah in the temple caught a vision of you in your holiness and glory, so we, where we are this morning, might catch a fresh vision of you, the God who is holy, the God who is glorious. And we pray that you would speak into our hearts and lives, so that as your people set apart to be holy before you and before the world, we might be challenged to live lives that are committed and dedicated to reflecting the beauty of Jesus. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Well, a study in the attributes of God is just what the doctor ordered for us during these challenging and difficult times focusing our attention on the wonder of who God is and the amazing things he has done for us, lifts us up out of our difficulties and struggles because of this present pandemic. It gives us a new perspective and a fresh vision of the God who created us, who loves us, and who has redeemed us in his Son, Jesus Christ. It inspires us to draw closer to him, to deepen our faith and our love and our commitment to him. Already in our series in the Attributes of God, we've looked at the themes of God as majestic and as righteous. This morning, I've been asked to lead us in looking at the theme of God is holy. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, Moses was filled with awe and wonder as he considered the holiness of God. Who else among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is glorious in holiness like you, so awesome in splendor, performing such wonders? What do we mean when we say that God is holy? Well, we mean that God in his very being and in his nature is majestic purity. God is so pure that he cannot even look upon sin. In Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, we are told, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Personally, that's why I believe that darkness covered the earth when Jesus took our sin on himself at the cross. It was as if the gaze of the Father was averted from watching his Son take upon himself your sin and my sin. And at that very moment as darkness fell, Jesus felt that desolating loss of fellowship with the Father, and he cried out in the darkness, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his systematic theology, Louis Berkhoff describes holiness as that perfection of God 
in virtue of which he eternally wills and maintains his own moral excellence, abhors sin, and demands purity in his moral creatures. <clears throat> and it's particularly that last phrase about demanding purity in us that causes our hearts to miss a beat. Most of us have a hard time grappling with this quality we call holiness. And yet we hear the voice of God speaking in Leviticus 20 and 26. You must be holy, because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from all other people. Just as God's holiness sets him apart from all others, so we are reminded that we must be separated from all those things in life that defile us if ever we are to live holy lives before God. 1 Peter 1.15 reminds us, Now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God, who chose you to be his children, is holy. Honestly, we don't find that easy. And there are times when living a holy life doesn't seem appealing or attractive to us. Having just listened to a long sermon and had his ear pulled several times by his dad for fidgeting, young Johnny walked out of church with a big frown on his face. "'What's the matter, Johnny?' asked one of the deacons. "'You look sad.' The frustrated youngster quickly replied, "'I am. It's hard to be happy and holy at the same time.'" Well, that's a very negative way of thinking about holiness. But it's not so long ago that the concept of holiness was associated with negative ideas like not wearing makeup, not going to the pictures, not going dancing, not going to the football match, generally not enjoying yourself. Somber, sober, and severe was the essence of what many evangelicals considered to be the way to holy living. But Andrew Murray, the South African preacher and theologian, set the record straight when he said this, Holiness is essential to true happiness. Happiness is essential to true holiness. If you would have joy, the fullness of joy, an abiding joy that nothing can take away, be holy as God is holy. Holiness is blessedness. So when God says, you must be holy because I am holy, it's because he wants us to live life to the full in the way it's meant to be lived, and so to experience genuine joy and fulfillment. The holiness of God shouldn't frighten believers but it should assure them that God is eternally good and pure in who he is and what he does. To help us understand how we can be holy, we need to focus on God himself in his holiness. And we see there, first of all, intrinsic holiness. There wasn't a moment in time when God decided he would become holy. He didn't develop holiness over a long period of time. God is holy and always has been holy and always will be holy. Holiness is intrinsic to his being and nature. When Isaiah had that incredible encounter with God in the temple, he heard the seraphim declaring God's holiness. Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We ought to remember as we come to worship God, we do this because he is a holy God and is worthy to receive our adoration and worship. 1 Samuel 2.2 says, No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. Psalm 99 verse 5 tells us, Bow low before his feet, 
for he is holy. Because our God's a holy God, everything about him is holy. His name is holy. Psalm 105 verse 3, exult in his holy name. His ways are holy. Psalm 77 verse 13, O God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? Psalm 98 verse 1, he has won a mighty victory by his power and holiness. All those things that are connected to God become holy by virtue of his holiness. Heaven, where God dwells, is God's holy temple. Psalm 11 verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. God's people are a holy people. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. And that's reflected from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, into the New Testament, under the New Covenant, in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And because of that, the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. And wherever sinful people have a life-transforming encounter with the living, holy God, that place becomes a holy place because the holy God is there. The burning bush, Moses was told, you're standing on holy ground. Joshua had a similar experience near Jericho when he met with God and was told, take off your sandals for this is holy ground. And for many of us, this church is holy ground. For we go back in our minds to remember many times when we've encountered this living, holy God, and he has touched our lives and transformed us. He has commissioned us and sent us out to be his servant. God is intrinsically holy. He is the source of holiness. No one and nothing apart from God is intrinsically holy. It's only through him that we can share in his holiness. So as we look at God's activity in human life and history, we discover holiness is an active quality, not a passive one. First of all, the holiness of God actively reveals sin. When Isaiah was confronted with the holiness of God in the temple, he was immediately convicted of his sin, and he cried out, my destruction is sealed, for I'm a sinful man and a member of a sinful race, yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The holiness of God revealed the sinfulness of Isaiah, and he was filled with a spirit of conviction and of contrition. Around the end of the 19th century, a young minister told the eminent Scottish preacher, Dr. Alexander White, that an acquaintance told him he could go several days without consciously sinning. He asked the older preacher whether he thought that could be possible. No, sir, White replied. No man who has seen the exquisite holiness of God would say a thing like that. The holiness of God actively reveals our sin. But isn't it true that people who live the closest to God are those, the very ones, who are most conscious of their sin and their unworthiness. That was true for Isaiah. It was also true for Job, who said this in Job 42.5, I had heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. It was true for Peter who said to Jesus in Luke 5 and verse 8, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. 
If we would live and walk closely with God, then we need to be prepared for the pain that comes when we discover just how sinful we are. The holiness of God actively reveals sin, but the holiness of God also actively opposes sin. God's holiness is his absolute and uncompromising standard against which everything and everyone is measured. God is holy and cannot coexist with sin. He is never ambivalent in his reaction to sin. His holiness condemns and judges sin. The moment God ceases to actively oppose sin, that moment he ceases to be holy. And in our own lives, we'll never be holy if we've a passive acceptance of our sin. It's so easy for us to look at others and to criticize and condemn the sin we see in their lives, and yet remain silent and complacent in the face of our own sin. But the person who lives really close to God and who has a strong desire to live a holy life must deal ruthlessly with personal sin. And to be holy as God himself is holy, we must actively oppose sin at all times when it reveals itself in our hearts and lives, and we must oppose it with a crusading zeal. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Seek to live a clean and holy life, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. So, God is intrinsically holy. But when we look at God, we also see, secondly, incarnate holiness. Supremely, God made holiness visible in the life of his one and only Son, Jesus. You remember Gabriel said to Mary in Luke 1.35, The baby born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And for 33 years, Jesus lived a life of unblemished purity and holiness on the earth under the full gaze of man. It wasn't even as if God gave Jesus preferential treatment so that he could live a pure and holy life in a sinful world. If anything, Jesus experienced greater temptation to sin than any one of us ever will, simply because he was the Son of God. Satan knew that God's purpose in redemption would fail if he could cause Jesus to sin. And so Satan gave Jesus his exclusive attention. And although we read in the scriptures of Jesus' temptation as a single event in the wilderness at the beginning of his earthly ministry, the actual reality was that he was under constant pressure of temptation. The temptation he faced didn't stop when Matthew 4.11 says, then the devil went away and left him. He faced temptation every day. Jesus had to be perpetually on guard spiritually so that he could live a pure, perfect, holy life before men. So, the writer to Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. That means he faced the temptations of pride and lust and greed and selfishness. The pressures of these sins were familiar to Jesus. He fought against them all and gained victory over them all. I think the secret of his spiritually victorious life was that his greatest motivation was to please God. In John 6, 38, Jesus said, I've come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do what I want. That supreme desire to do the will of God and to please him enabled Jesus to live a spotlessly pure and holy life. And that's the secret for gaining victory over sin in our own lives. We must really want to please God and do his will in everything. 
And we'll never live a holy life by trying to please others or by pleasing ourselves. We'll only make progress on the journey towards holiness when we live to please God and do His will. And that will mean making fundamental choices like choosing the way of sacrifice. For Jesus, the pathway of holiness meant choosing to walk the way of the cross. That's the same choice that confronts every Christian who wants to be holy. We must be willing to sacrifice our desires, our ambitions, our lives to gain a Christ-like purity and holiness. As Dr. Jim Packer said, when a man knows God, losses and crosses cease to matter to him. Paul presents the challenge this way in Romans 12.1. I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll know what God wants you to do, and you'll know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. Do you want your life to be a living and holy sacrifice for God? Then you have to be willing to sacrifice all for Jesus, as John Stainer's lovely hymn says, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being's ransomed powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. Choosing the way of sacrifice and then also choosing the way of sanctification. Holiness and sanctification both have to do with the concept of separation. There are two aspects to sanctification. Sanctification is a separation to God, but it's also a separation from sin. Our lives cannot be set apart for God unless they've first been set apart from sin. Sadly, there are some Christians who think they can have what God offers and what the world offers at the same time. Nothing can be further from the truth. Some try to live with one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world, but it just can't be done. And what's more, God won't allow it. Choosing the way of sanctification is saying yes to God and no to the world. Speaking of that pagan world, God tells us in 2 Corinthians six seventeen, come out from them and separate yourselves from them. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters. If we really want to know God in that way, our response has to be clear and unambiguous. And Paul, at the end of that passage in 2 Corinthians 6 on separation, climaxes it with these words in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body and spirit, and let us work towards complete purity because we fear God. But even though we strive to be pure and holy like Jesus, even though we choose the way of sacrifice and sanctification. We'll only attain that holiness on that day when we're taken up into his nearer presence. While I'm here on earth, I'm on a journey towards holiness. But as the old gospel hymn says, I'm only ever a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Intrinsic holiness, the very nature of God himself. Incarnate holiness, revealed perfectly in Jesus. And finally, imputed holiness. 
Isaiah 6, 6 shows us that this is what God did for Isaiah as soon as he confessed his sin and his worthlessness. Then one of the seraphim flew, flew over the altar, and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And God has done for us in Jesus Christ what he did through that burning coal the seraphim took from off the altar. He has cleansed us from our sins. And his holiness has been imputed to us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. He is the one who makes us acceptable to God. He made us pure and holy, and he gave himself to purchase our freedom. In Ephesians 4, 24, Paul says, You must display a new nature because you are a new person, created in God's likeness, righteous, holy, and true. It's an amazing miracle of grace that through Jesus Christ our Lord, every Christian stands before a holy God as a holy person. And that gives us amazing confidence. We're able to own the words that Isaiah said in Isaiah 61.10, I'm overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. You and I, who believe in Jesus, who have entrusted our lives and our future to him, you and I, who own his name and call ourselves Christians, have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We do not come into the presence of a holy God bearing our own righteous deeds. All our righteous deeds are as filthy rags in his sight. But we come into his holy presence clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Our God, my brothers and sisters, our God is a holy God, and he calls us apart to be a holy people belonging to him. This morning, we're faced with the challenge to choose the way of holiness and to make the prayer that Zechariah made in Luke chapter 1 and verse 75 our prayer, that we might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness forever. Please join me in prayer. Our Father, you are a holy God, and we bow in humility in your presence this morning. We are, like Isaiah of old, conscious of our sinfulness, aware of how our sin offends you and grieves your heart but how we praise and thank you for Jesus, the one whom you sent to be our holy Savior, to give his life pure and spotless in exchange for ours on the cross of Calvary, taking upon himself all our sin, bearing its punishment, taking our place, and paying the price. And we thank you that because of his finished work, we this morning 
who own your name are made righteous and holy in your sight. Help us, Father, in all that we do to choose the way of holiness, to sacrifice ourselves for you, and to seek to honor Jesus in our lives so that one day we might joyfully acclaim him when he comes for us. So bless us, we pray, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. A massive thank you to Bill for leading us in God's word this morning. So we just close our service with Aaron's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Will that word go with us into this week? Have a blessed week, friends. Your kingdom shall not pass away. Oh, it should not be.